This episode of Oops the Podcast is brought to you by Hangobi, delicious beverage, uh, all for all sorts of utility and pleasure, mixing with alcoholic beverages. The wake here gets you going. Dad, give, give us some ad read action. We got Big G in the mix here. What do you like about Hangobi? Take a sip. Go. I haven't tasted it yet. All right, well, all right. he has not yet tasted it. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, you like it? Pretty, yeah, really good, actually. Can I get this can? Yeah, you can have it. Okay, I'm getting it. It's all yours. All right. Big G has spoken. Hang Obi is the drink. Tell me, tell us more about it. Come on, set, be a salesman. Well, it tastes good, and and then it tastes good. There we go. It and, tastes good, and then and it, it tastes just, good. And it tastes, it tastes great. It so tastes good. Can, let me try another sip here. Take another sip. He says, uh, it tastes good, it tastes good, and then it tastes great. Spoken by the yeah, man himself. Yeah, no, it, it's it's very good. It's, um, it's refreshing. It's got a kind of like spring to it. Yeah. Is that is it like one of those power drinks? Cause it, yeah, sure is one of those power drinks. Uh, you know, this is a drink that is great for sort of like, like it says, the wake. Waking up in the morning, if you had a long night, you haven't slept a lot, whatever, this can get you going. I could have used this last night because it was falling asleep driving back home Yeah. Uh, from New York. Yeah. So, I mean, I really... This is great. So, uh, yeah, there we go. He, he right. spoken well by the big G himself. Get yourself some Hangobi. You can go find the uh, store finder online on the Hangobi website if you're looking for a spot near you. It's in over 500 stores around the country. Um, and be sure to use our promo code if you're ordering online. Promo code Oops, I'm hung. 30% off of your order. Uh, they have a bunch of great flavors. The essential, the calm, which has a little bit of melatonin in it. So, you know, you go to bed and have a nice little, uh, either way, hangobi.com. Keep your eyes peeled for hangobi, a delicious drink and our, uh, you know, our beverage of oops, the podcast. So hangobi. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yes or no. Did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior I engaged in. All right, guys, welcome back to Oops the Podcast. Today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, we love this guy. He's my literal father. Uh, give it up for Julio Gallerati Sr., a.k.a. Big G. Wow. What up? What up? What up? Thank you for coming. Uh, you know, good to see you. Great. It's great to be here. It's my first show. It's a First you know, pod? Very, very excited. Very excited. Very excited to have you. Uh, the hat's looking good. Thank Did you, you buy that in Ireland? Well, yeah, I just got back from Ireland, Scotland, and uh, just, I'm going to be wearing it everywhere I go. It's, it's a little warm now because it's 95 out <laughs> <laughs> um, I gotta, you know, have that look. I didn't like it, but your mom said you look good. And she I liked said, it. I don't think so. Yeah, there's yeah. something there. I, the, I have the same thing with Hillary, where if she thinks I look good in something, nothing else matters, right? Because like, even if I think I look like shit, if she's like, "Wow, you look amazing," that trumps anything that I previously thought about the way that I think that I look. Yeah. So she convinced me that I look good, so I must look good. I'm, I don't think so, but you know. So you I wore good. it, you know, in honor of you. Come back and. I brought you some stuff. I pre yeah, I'd love to see can it. I give it. Okay. Yeah, so, we. Uh, I appreciate it. It's it. Nice can of you. Show it to the camera. Yeah, you can show it to okay, the camera. I got this shot glass. Excellent. Which is interesting because <laughs> there's an interesting story behind it. I bought it for like uh, four euros or five euros, and then uh, we went in for we were on a tour, so they took us to the, this distillery, and I noticed that people coming out of the distillery were doing tasting. And they got one of these glasses, mm. and so you know that's I'm, very nice. Kind of cheap. I'm frugal. <laughs> so I asked the lady that I bought it from, I said, do they give one of these out to everybody who goes, in? He goes okay, can I get my money back? <laughs> so I got four years anyway. So this is from... Um, Wait, what do you mean you get your money back? Why would... No, see, I bought it originally. I bought it for four euros. Then I noticed they were giving them out for free ah, to people. You so I was on that tour. So, uh, <laughs> were you so, able to get a refund? Yeah, I did. Right. You yeah. did. Yeah. You returned the shot glass. Shot got the shot. That, got the refund. Thank you very much. This is great. And I, I got to. some little nips um, from Kilbegan Distillery. That's uh, very very beautiful thoughtful. part of Ireland. They're just. I know. I know you don't. You don't drink much. Is that's what you told me anyway? <laughs> These are little shots. Well, I oh, thank you. You can single malt scotch. Oh, these are cool, and this is clearly like mm -hmm. custom made because the the amounts are different. Unless you were taking a couple. No, oh, thank no, you. No, no, no. So this is scotch. 
No, no, no. Oh, Irish, Irish whiskey, whiskey is better, actually. It's uh, Irish whiskey is better because yeah. it's distilled three times. Scotch is only distilled twice. Got it. So, so uh, Irish whiskey is the it's, best whiskey. It's, yeah, yeah. Irish. So buy Thank Jameson. You. If you're buying, that's good whiskey. But any Irish distillery, any local stuff is really good, too. Thank you. This yeah. is very thoughtful. I appreciate it. And I, uh, I bought an Irish whistle. It's a, it looks like some sort of flute. It is a flute, but it's called an Irish whistle. And um, so I just started playing it. Can you... <laughs> Okay, so, all right. That's <laughs> nice, right? Yeah, so that's the first you know, song I learned. That's, what is, wait, that's an actual song? Yeah, I just made it up. Oh, okay, actually. okay. There was a couple moments where there was some melody happening. It was very songy. Yeah, it sounded like the beginning of, uh, you know, the <clears throat> Banshees of Incheren. You know, all of a sudden Colin Farrell pops out with some sort of social problem. I don't know. He doesn't seem to want to be my friend anymore. That was uh, a weird movie. I liked it. <laughs> Not you weren't yeah, a fan? I mean, it was just, well, yeah, it was crazy. I, I didn't know what it was about. And at one point in the middle... Brendan Gleeson just cut all his fingers off for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, really? Spoiler alert. You know, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Didn't that say that? No, I mean, oh. you have to, if you haven't seen the Academy Award nominated movies at this point, it's okay. Like, you deserve to have it be spoiled, you know? In my opinion. I don't know. So, but yeah, he literally cuts all his fingers off. It's crazy. I messed you up on a spoiler alert once with oh, James, the greatest God. spoiler, James Bond. And it's why I didn't even think of it. But <laughs> yeah, I just said, no, he's, it just never dawned on me that I'm, you know, killing this movie for you because i didn't i think you're a fan of james bond but we can okay this is another spoiler that's fair to deliver at this point this movie came out three years ago so but i he calls me he's like i'm like what are you up to he goes i just want to see the new bond movie i go how was it he goes it sucked they killed him in the end i'm like are you serious i haven't s- <laughs> you've been big g'd <laughs> Yeah, you've been big. G- yeah, yeah, it's kind of like hey, you've been big G. <laughs> <laughs> That's spectacular. Um, all right, so we got a lot of good stuff to cover here. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. There's a couple of things that I think everybody would love to hear about uh, from you. One of them being a recent thing that happened to you, and I'd love to hear more about this. You were saying how you were sitting on somebody's car, and you got yelled at for sitting on the car. And I forget, you had some take on it that I don't specifically remember, but I'd love to hear the story and I'd love to hear well, your perspective. Well, it was this kind of like um, tough, tough girl, you know, mm-hmm. kind of tough, rugged, tough biker chick kind of, you know, tough girl. So uh, I'm waiting for my hot dog at Higgy's. Nice. Right? We yeah. obviously live in a big town, right? You're waiting for your hot dog at Higgy's, the local, like... Uh, it's like an outdoor... It's not like an outdoor place, but there's no indoor seating. You order at the window. It's sort of like an old-fashioned park-and-eat situation. Yeah. So, you know, I went for my hot dog, and there are no benches, and there's this Ford, like, th- the F-350. The it's big not, one. It's not the F-150. It's not the 250. It's the 350. They use it to, like, <laughs> to like move, like, mobile homes. <laughs> Ser- seriously. It's just like, like, seriously. It's the biggest truck. And so, yeah. So I'm leaning just slightly against it. And she said, uh, you know, uh, that's not, you know, it's rude. I said, what? Leaning on somebody's car is rude. I said, is this, yeah, it's mine. I said, this is a Ford 350. I mean, you know, it, it can survive a nuclear explosion. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, and it's dirty. It's like you just took it like through a river. It was dirty? Yeah, I mean, she took it through a river somewhere. It's like, okay, I understand. She goes, you understand, right? I said, yeah, I understand. So then you got off the car? No. No. <laughs> he definitely got off the no. car. No. Oh, I should know. You you stayed there? For a little while. And then I said, okay. All right. Did she notice that you were still there? Yeah. And she's just staring at me. And she, I said, okay, well, I'll get off, you know. But you can lean on my car any day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, my car's over there. But you had said, you're like, if this is some sort of general thing that you don't know about, then you're okay with it. But if not, 
Well, I mean, right? so what's the etiquette? Like, um, you know, like in the city, you, everyone's sitting on cars in the city because there are no benches. I've never seen, I, I'll be honest, I don't know how often I've seen people sitting on other people's cars. I'm just saying. I'm not, I don't necessarily disagree with you. But if somebody were just sitting on my car, I, I wonder how I would. If, all right, if somebody was sitting on your car, you wouldn't be like, all right. No, I wasn't sitting on it. I was leaning, leaning on it. It's too tall a set. I'd have to take a ladder to sit on it. So I was just leaning against the bumper, le you know, leaning, not not which, sitting on the car, leaning. Which So the back of the car you were leaning on? No, I was the, toward the front of the car. I was leaning. I was, <laughs> I was leaning on the front grill kind of. You were right, like, leaning literally on the front. Okay. So you were yeah. just leaning, yeah. but your arm perhaps was on the top of the grill or? I, I don't know. I mean, it was just leaning against it, not sitting on it, so. So if you're leaning on somebody's car, it's not sitting. I can understand sitting, okay. but leaning, you know, so what's the, you know, word on that? What's the know. etiquette? Is there a car etiquette? I'm not totally sure. If someone were leaning on your car though, leaning, just leaning yeah, on the side, you're fine, you're fine with that. Why not? Yeah. Who, uh, who wouldn't be, you know? I don't, yeah. That's a good question. I don't, I don't really your know. Your audience will probably get back to you on this, but they will. I think they will. You know, what's the car etiquette? Leaning on car etiquette. Did you have your food yet or were you still waiting? I was waiting for my food. I was in eating. I was just waiting for my food. Okay. She that was leaning on it too. She was leaning she on was it She was also on her car. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so I'm thinking. She's you guys like, were lean, you guys were hanging out together. She's three feet. She, she was, was short. three feet. She was short. Yeah, she was a munchkin. She's, I mean, you know, she's leaning on I can't. I can't picture her driving this car. Because she'd need like you know an elevator to get in, so I said, "This is not, <laughs> this is not her car. Right. This is not her car." So you I'll figured that I, you were both yes. leaning on the car together, yes. and then it, it didn't belong to her. That's right. Got it. So that's my reasoning. Pretty pretty sound, I think. You know? Yeah, I will say this: if I were already leaning on my car and someone else came and started to lean on the car with me, it would make it. It's weird in its own way, but but it's it's not as bad. Like if I was far away and I saw someone leaning, I'd be worried that maybe they were going to do something to it. And especially if you're in a place, I'm starting to to take your side a little more on this right. because you're in a place Fine, where you're- you never ever take my side. I do sometimes. Ever. That's not true. You never, you always disagree with me. Really? Yes. You never ever take my side on anything. Really? That's upsetting to hear. Yes. I think that I do take, I, well, okay. It's just a kid thing. I it's can a, improve on it's, that. It's a, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's a, like uh, growing up, kind of thing you always got to just interest yourself no, in your father no. i no i agree with with stuff what else do i disagree with besides everything <sighs> but okay but you give me bits you give me bits and i know i i like my approach to what i'm doing so i don't need bits like when i'm out and like i i'll tip someone and give them enough or you know when, i don't do that no it wasn't a tip it was like i'm out and i'm in a restaurant and i do something you say, should have done that or um I can't, I can't think. Of I that. allow you to do your stuff. You say the ginger thing at Sugarfish. I allow you to do that. I'm fine with it. Well, what's wrong with the ginger nothing, thing? Nothing. Nothing. I actually think, ginger. I think it's nice. I think it's nice. No, honestly, you, do. you think that's a little uh, sketchy? No, I like the, I like your approach. You you do it at the beginning, and if it's not busy, you go listen. You're not busy. I I'm gonna keep asking you for ginger. If you would like to front load us with ginger now. I wouldn't hate it. You and think they, people would not agree with that? Though? No, I think it's fine. I'm just saying, like, if I were to be like that, I'd be like, Dad, but I don't do that. I allow you to do your thing. Okay. You know? All right. Um, I do not disagree with your way in general. I would say that of our family, even, I perhaps let you do your thing more so than maybe the rest of our family. No, but I, I have always done kind of like sketchy things, right? I mean, we used to remember, go to McDonald's when you're small. I do remember that. And we would always share a soda. We would share a soda. Because they're so big, I don't want to buy two, so I get a cup. You get an extra cup. Extra cup, and we'd share a soda. I we, did not like no that, trouble. yeah. Well, you didn't like that. Well, at the time, I didn't like it. I wanted my own, but it's okay. Like I accepted. Well, yeah, you got enough though, right? You got enough soda. I probably didn't need sketchy. more soda. What, what was it? Because it was sketchy, or you didn't get enough? I, I think it was every. I think it, the 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 mm. surprise from the clerk at the question <laughs> was the hardest part for me. They look at me like I'll have a large soda and two small water cups, and they were kind of like, and you're like, yeah, like water cups, and then you'd fill the soda, which. May be controversial. It's free refills typically at these places. So you have figured out a way to get around getting another soda. You fill the soda. That's what I do. And then you you ration out some in the small cups, which I get is like a is a money saving measure. You know, two boys, growing boys. It's not cheap. You know, it is. It's cheap. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's sketchy. 
Yeah. No, I admit it. It's okay. I'm, it's cool. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's good. It's good. No, I, I was fine with, like, like, but, you know, that, like, gave, I, at the time, I didn't like it, maybe, because I was, whatever. That's okay. Embar- I was embarrassed. Right. But That's okay. you're embarrassed of your parents when you're a kid. I don't know. That's like. Well, that's what it is. Yeah, I know. I am. Yes. I'm not and currently embarrassed. I went out of my way to be more embarrassing. When you I did. wear the hats and. Yes, you, you know, did. Choo choo. And yeah, yeah. went in a. I, I wore a conductor's hat in a cool store where, like, <laughs> it's in Boston and it looks like a candy shop. And you walk in and the back door slides open. You go into this boutique, shoe boutique. Yeah, yeah. A hat boutique. And the place is called Bodega. And the, the Sprite machine opens or something. And then you go into this cool store. I took my parents. And then you, he started being funny. I wore a conductor's hat. He wore a conductor's I hat. I to one of the girls. and go, choo-choo. And you're, you're like, <laughs> you're pretty annoyed. <laughs> and Alessia was mortified. <laughs> We were, yeah, that was embarrassing. But listen, you know, whatever. It is what it is. It's all good. I like you doing your thing. Um, and we have some good audience questions from people too. But before we get that, before we get there, there's a lot of good I'm stuff. I'm going to get another drink because this yeah. is so good and it's giving me energy to like- Keep enjoying the hangover. Yeah, really, really good. Keep enjoying the hangover, dad. Uh, we love it. Okay. So tell us more about the your mole hunting extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like, <laughs> I don't know, moles are a problem because they dig up they all these. So we need more context. So this is in the lo- on your in your lawn. Yeah, well, my I see oh, Butch is even crazier. He's About putting, the moles? Yeah, he's putting electronic devices that make noise to you know, shoot them away. And then they, oh, so they don't even come in the area. Well, he thinks so, but it, it doesn't work. It kind of shoots vibrations and sounds, So it's but it doesn't really work. It's kind of It like, doesn't work. So there's still moles. Yeah, there's moles, and uh, so sometimes there are mole traps, but, you know, um, sometimes I'll get annoyed and do a Bill Murray thing. Remember in the uh, Caddyshack? Yes, yes, He'd yes. go down the hole and put dynamite down there. <laughs> and, you know, C.O. Butch actually tried pouring gasoline down there and burning him out. <laughs> but that's not, you know, that's not, you know, he's not good. Do you have to fire. light the ground on fire, though? Yeah, yeah, he's not good with, like, you know, fire. Uh, <laughs> So it didn't cu- quite work. Sometimes I would, um, you know, kind of you you press down part of the ridge that they make, and if they go through again, you see it. And so I take a shovel and slam it. But that you have to literally catch them in action. Yeah, I mean, that's hard. So like I gave that up. But one time I slammed one. It, I see it <laughs> kind of like, and I just came down hard with a shovel and just nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. Like I always thought moles were a thing everybody knew about because I didn't know any better because I was a kid. But like moles, I, they're like they don't have eyes. I don't think they're these blind rodents. And they, I'm going, I'm going Daniel Boone, no Davy Crockett. You're wearing the mo- this is t- yeah. It looks sort of like the hat that my dad is currently changing into. Uh, and they 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 make the ground messed up. So like they make they mole around and they displace the ground. So it and it makes it ugly and and people consider them pests. So they try to get rid of them. But they live underground. They literally live underground. It's crazy. And one of the funniest things I ever saw, I saw this video of a guy. Uh, his his wife was in the garden, and she said, "You know, I've got these mold problems. They're digging up all my roots. Would you take care of it?" And the guy goes, "Okay, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. I could take." And so later, she said, "Did you take care of that mole?" And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, what'd you do? Did you, you know, did you kill it? Uh, did you hit it with a hammer? No, I did worse. Did you burn it? No, I did worse. He said, I buried him alive. And she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> Which is just sending him home. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's real? Yeah, that's probably me and Zio <laughs> Butch, you know, like living in the country. We were still learning how to do this, you know, because we said, I grew up in the Bronx. And where I grew up. If you had a tree on your block, you lived in the country. I mean, literally. Yeah. So we lived in um, always small apartments. Uh, we kept getting higher and higher. My father first, we had a three-room apartment and um, uh, second floor. And then my father moved us to the fifth floor to save money. So it was like, he's like me. You know, Walk like, up. Yeah, yeah. Five floor. Well, that's why I, I, I had blazing speed as a kid because I'd walk up and down five flights 10, 15 times a day. So I had these incredibly strong legs. You were I an could a run young athlete. and jump. Yeah. Yeah. So that really helped. But interesting. So wait, so you but you grew up on the famous Arthur Avenue, right? Well, near right near Arthur Avenue. So my mother would take me uh shopping there as a little boy. 
and they had a live chicken, uh, kind of a, a chicken. You can buy live, I live guess they market. Call it a live market, yes. Shout and out you to can COVID. Buy pigeons, and you can yeah, shout out COVID. You could buy rabbits. <laughs> you could, you could buy, buy rabbits. Pigeons, and I'd watch how they murder these chickens. And what they do is they slit its throat, let it bleed out, and then they <laughs> they pour it in in boiling water. They pour the blood in boiling. No, water? not I'm sorry. They dip the chicken in boiling water to make uh, it supple. Because the feathers, uh, otherwise you have to pull them out. And when you boil it, the feathers come out easy. And they run over these spoons that were turning around and kind of defeather it. But they beat the shit out of the chicken. And so the meat was like. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it was like putty. Wow. That's cool. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Yeah, like cool. chicken. Sweet. Well, then this. So if you guys aren't familiar, that area. There's a lot of famous stories based on that area. It's a famous area, famous part of New York City. And that, sh that movie Bronx Tale literally takes place not only in that neighborhood, but during the time where you would have been a kid in that neighborhood, right? That kid is me. It's, he's growing up in the 60s. He lives on 187th Street. I lived on 187th Street. Crazy. Mickey Mantle was his idol. Mickey Mantle was my idol. So that, that, that's me. That's, that's me. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Well, speaking of which, my, my dad's a big baseball fan still, and- my manager Zach happens to be the plug for tickets, and he you keep hitting him up for tickets. We gotta, we might have to cut you off soon, dude. <laughs> he's only come through once, and he's still, you know. <laughs> well, he got you Astros, though. That's a good. Why well, keep building him up to make him, you know? Hey, man, you're you're a big dude. You can easily do this because <laughs> Yankees Astros is a tough ticket. That's a to tough get, ticket. That, that's Ryan's a big really fan nice. too. Well, but I kind of like feed into it, like his image as a super talent agent yeah right. and so he's he can do anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so now he has to come through because you know <laughs> you know yeah gotta live up to his uh image very good but, yeah he's okay crazy he's a good kid. sometimes i think about this i mean I, th I think that this is a thing that everybody has in life but like the idea of all the things that had to happen for you and mom to meet and for me well, to exist. I mean, you came over here on a boat that sank a year later. Well, no, I no, I think that no. Yeah, I think the, I, yeah. I I may have come in on the Andre and the Dior. I don't you did. think so. You did. We, you we confirmed it on Ellis Island when you went. You found you found your migration stuff, and I you came so. on the Andrea I'm Doria, sure. which I'm sank not, the following year. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, you sent me a picture. Uh, maybe. So first of all, you had to survive the voyage. You both survived the voyage. Well, no, she came over and uh, she came over a little bit later. She but on a different boat. And, on a different, yeah. And then you guys met in college around the corner from where we're recording this podcast. Well, yeah, um, yeah, sixty eighth Street and Lex uh, Hunter College. Yeah, and what could you want to share a little bit of with us? Your game, like how you, how you got mom to go on a date with you and stuff. No, there's not much game there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pretty pathetic really not much game no there's no game no but would you you asked her out I, yeah yeah and so um <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm talking about this no it was kind of like okay i'm so kind of i was so bashful so i'd ask someone if they wanted to do something and if they said no i never talked to them again right, like right. i didn't know how you know i was never persistent mm -hmm. um and um, so I said, uh, when I say, um, do you want to go to this uh, nightclub called Dance 3? And she goes, well, I'm not free that night. And I said, okay, well, that's that. Oh, really? <laughs> no way. So then so, that's what, so and, how did you overcome? And then she said, oh, but on another night, had she not said that, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be here. Wow. Jesus. Mom, thank you. It just took one... <laughs> Small things can, you know, change our lives. I know. It's uh, crazy. So if she had not offered an alternative date, that's it, that, that's it's it. over. Done. I don't think that that is unusual. I mean, you know, it's good to get the hint in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Although it's not always when you're leaning on somebody's truck, apparently, you know, <laughs> just get the hint right away. But eventually the hint comes through. Yeah. So, I mean, that truck thing is... Uh, I'm not going to mess the truck up. So what is it like a, an etiquette thing? Is that a pride thing that you're leaning on my car? You have to ask permission. You know, is it a pride thing? Because it's not a, a physical thing, right? Because I'm not going to mess the car. Right. But okay, this is what so I think. So it's a pride thing. It's like, she, and same reason she has tattoos and 15 belts. You know, right, right. Giant buckles. She's tough. She's tough. She's like, don't mess with me. Mess with me. 
Right. Don't sit on my car. Don't do that. You know, so yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's an image thing. That's what I was going to say. It seems as if maybe she is, is not the biggest person and she wanted to prove that you can't her. like like you were you were trying to stunt on her physically You're yeah I'm bigger a big than guy. her i'm a big guy and she was like you know guys. what this big guy has met his match today yeah and you, she was correct it's a way kind of like uh, dealing with past you know experiences like yeah guys pushing around okay now this guy i'm getting him back because he's the first guy popped out of the foxhole i'm totally. gonna take him out by the way shout out the big gt came out nice right you like this I love it. I gotta so get me one of you those. You gotta get you one. We're we're gonna send you one. They they it's kind of designed in the same vein as the late '90s hip hop covers. Uh, shout out to Andy Paz. It's He's hot doing, right now. It's hot right it's now, a hot bro. Style. This is a Wait hot a style. You're you're joking. No, this looks like the U- the juvenile 400 degrees album cover. I'm gonna show it to this you. Is, this is trendy. This is the type of outfit that people are wearing to concerts. And Seriously, going out. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Andy is a great graphic designer. Uh, check him out, Andy Brand. Oh my Instagram. god! So this could become a thing. Like, no, oh I'm gonna show god. you. I'm gonna show you. You're look. gonna be walking down the street and you're gonna see somebody wearing one of these shirts. <laughs> look at that. Okay. Right? All right. You see the similarity? Big G. What does that say underneath? Yeah, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um very very good um okay well so while we have you here i thought it would be a good opportunity because you know famously you give me a lot of suggestions sometimes for stand up and they're, i they're i pretty, they're always bad no i humor one them. out of a hundred they're not bad they're just like not something that i would think of and that might be maybe they're good suggestions but there's plenty of good approaches but we must choose an approach that's the only way forward right so much too kind i mean i think you know i after I think about them, they're pretty lame, but I keep shooting. No, and it's fine. And if I, I and I let one. you do it. I let you say them. But then sometimes the, your approach, sometimes I don't agree with, where you, you say something and the way you say it. And I know it's hard to do. So like, listen, but you keep trying, which I respect. But if you have some tips now, we can let everybody decide if they're things that I should in fact do. And this would be a nice moment for you if everybody takes your side. So, Well, I give you one that you actually use. Well, just my life. You, I mean, you use my life. So the uh, the Italian guy that said, "Yeah, yeah, that was a good one." I know where the seat belt that because I can jump out. Yeah, <laughs> that, it's like yes. <laughs> so that was like no, you I didn't even. One. I just talked about my life, and you you. I grabbed that as one. you said. I'm funniest when I try not to be funny. When I try to be funny, it's not. You said that. Don't try to be funny. Just be yourself. Well, listen. That's the key, in my opinion, to stand up. When people cross. <clears throat> into a place where they can be the real deal as a stand-up. They've figured out how to do that without changing when going into funny mode, right? They call it finding your voice. So how do you do the stuff that you do that's funny naturally and then present it as funny as well without being like, oh, da, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah In my yeah, opinion. Yeah. So if you have a suggestion for me, what, what what do you got? What do you want to give me right well, now? Not, nothing at the moment. I just. Have but you had one about so. Texas for me. Well, no. So most of my most of our relatives in the United States are Texans. Right. We are because the family went to two places: Philadelphia, oh no, Pennsylvania around Pittsburgh mining, and the others went to Fort Worth, Texas, to work in the Ranzoni factory. That's about a hundred years ago or so. And that so, is too funny. The Italians moved here to work in the pasta factory. Yes. So our family worked in the pasta factory. Well, back then, I think. So what? How did they? Were they recruiting Italians probably, to make probably. it more authentic? That, that, that's what. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know how they ended up there. <laughs> was it a coincidence that they were just like migrant workers? You no, know, I never. Yeah, I should ask. Um, That's pretty funny. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. But anyway, they worked there and they settled in Fort Worth. And so well, most of my cousins are, are down in Texas and a bunch, uh, some of them are going to come see you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so big shout out to them. Hell yeah. Really awesome. Great people. Wonderful people. Love them dearly. Uh, but I've never been to Texas. It's funny. The one place. You've never been once? It's really weird. I've been everywhere else, but for some reason- it's funny. I uh, had an inter job interview in Texas, Austin, but I never went down because I had a job here. But it's really weird that I've never been to Texas. Yeah, you know. uh, yeah, that is crazy, actually. And it is funny to think about from my life too. I remember when you were saying so. He interviewed a couple of different places all over the country. We ended up in Connecticut, but I do think about what my life would be like if I had ended up in Texas or you know Northern California or any of these places. Or I think right. Do you yeah, see well, Davis? you wouldn't have been living, you know. Um, on FIP up on uh, 92nd Street. You know? Yeah. Well, who knows? Who knows? Though? Who knows? Who the who hell knows, knows what I would have, what I would have ended The tennis up with. thing was really weird too because um, I never pushed it. I never even introduced it. Hey, come play tennis so you like it. Never, nothing. I said nothing. 
and you picked it up in camp with Samir and you liked it and then I went into action then I taught you unless you'll follow it along and so I worked hard with you guys and uh, you became very good tennis players yeah so this is a fun story too so I knew that you had played tennis and I had sort of seen you you know playing and I, I, I always thought it was cool right so just like my old man, right? I got a tennis racket in my hand one day and I decided I was going to start playing and try, try it out or whatever. And the way, I don't know if you know this. Do you know this? So the reason why we started playing tennis is be, we used to play another game on those courts where we would throw balls at each other. <laughs> it, I think we created some game that didn't exist. It was some version of dodgeball and we were just ripping basketballs, whatever we could get, Correct. throwing them at each other. You guys found out and you snitched. You called the camp. Well, yeah. I mean, you're like like hurling weapons at each other. Like, <laughs> what the what the t WTF? You know, what kind of camp is this? I know. Agreed. So it's fine. I, I'm fine with that. In retrospect, we snitched. You guys snitched, but and I found out. I didn't know that it was you that had snitched, but I found out later somehow. Somehow that that got down through the grapevine. But that's why we started playing real tennis. All right. So you actually man accidentally cool. manifested me becoming a tennis player. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And you really could argue cool. that I might not be where I am right now. No, specifically, you, I don't mean no, stature. No, you wouldn't if know not who for tennis. you know. You wouldn't. Your your circle of friends wouldn't be the same. Right. It would be. I may not have ended up in New York. You may not have. You know, of course, yeah. So small things. It's amazing how small things could yeah, like um, make a big difference. Like you know, uh, uh, what do they call butterfly it? effect? Um, the uh, not butterfly, but um, uh, the get to the fork. There, there the fork. Forks in the road. All the time in your life, mm -hmm. in just a small turn. Totally. Uh, yeah. Well, so but the, so I'm I, getting too philosophic. No, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so no, I I because I I got a tennis a job teaching tennis in the in the Hamptons, which kind of like nudged me to end up coming to the city. Made some great friends, and you know, ended up living the life that I do. And who knows? Maybe the, maybe this life sucks. Like maybe I sit here being like, you know, I wouldn't be where I am, and I'm like, well. This is stressful. Like maybe I could have become like a Buddhist and I would have had a much more peaceful journey than sort of like the stressful life that is being a comedian. But I, I ultimately like it. I like what I'm doing. How did you feel? I know people ask you this, but we got a couple of messages about questions to ask you. And one of them was, how do you feel about the fact that I have become a comedian? And walk us through that experience when I introduced it to where we are now. Well, I mean, you know, at first, okay, so you had uh, the job in commercial real estate. I mean, it was a good so It wasn't it the was, job. It was a great job. It was potentially a great job. To to clarify, it was a sales job. It was a commercial real estate brokerage. So it was a good job, but it wasn't like you know Goldman Sachs. But there was big chance. There down was a the chance road, yeah. Down the road, there was that part. On um, yeah, so I mean, lawyers. We're quitting their jobs and asking you if they can intern for you at some point. I do remember that. That was crazy. Okay, so that's a that's a job and a half. <sighs> okay, fine. Or at not. The, at this job they were asking? I think, yeah, specifically this lawyer wanted to be my intern. I By the way, I worked at this job for nine months. So I was really good at it until, so this is the thing. I was really good at that job till I had to start the actual job. The first six months you train, train yeah. and a lot of these guys who do this job, are they're not like intellectual people. I'm not saying that I am, but they're not like, they're guys who work hard, they have chutzpah. The, they don't, the, the uh, boiler room type Exactly. Guys. They can have really hard conversations. Yeah. But, you know, learning isn't always their best thing. So here I am, and not that it's my best thing, but it was easy. Like I learned the stuff, we go in the, in the room, does anybody know the answer to this? I know the answer. I know the answer. I'm doing great. The day comes, I get my license. Now I'm trying to do this job and I'm calling people and I'm going to meet them and they see me show up on their doorstep and I look, I've always looked a little younger at every stage of my life and these Hasidic guys would laugh in my face. They'd be like, you're going to sell my building. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And they'd be like, okay, come, come. And then they'd be nice to me, but they didn't take me seriously. You know what I mean? So it was hard and I just found it hard to like, be annoying and persistent and calling and, and being not taking no for an answer. I just, I, it was a hard job for me. And Zigita told me, my aunt, may she rest in peace, dear aunt, uh, she was like, You're kidding, you're fooling yourself doing this job. We all know, she goes, This is not the job for you. You have to be an aggressive, always be closing, cold caller. Yeah. You know, big, big selling stud. And yeah. there, I, I started that way on my first job at a college, actually. Um, I worked for a real estate company that was basically selling swampland in Florida. Seriously. Oh yeah, yeah, I did know. General about well, I won't say the name, but um, anyway, so we had a we had to sell pieces of land that weren't yet developed, 
And uh, there was an interesting scam they had going. Wait, so was you, were you working as part of a scam unknowingly? No, no, they had a scam. Yeah, yes. Unknowingly, I was being scammed. You were being scammed by the dispatcher. And wow, no. what a full circle tale, by the way, but that the brilliant. same thing's now happening to us with the olive oil. Oh, for, for <laughs> olive oil, yeah. I'm, I'm a sucker. <laughs> it's like if you, uh, if you're, anybody out there is a scammer, just get my um, contact info from Julio. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a... I'm ready. I'm a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. So tell us more about the Swampland bit. Or the, so the I realized, this, and it's brilliant. It's brilliant. So they put these ads in the paper. Never answer ads in the paper. They're like, you'll make 500 a day. Never. Ever. Yeah. Do not do that. And if anyone's listening. And that's what you did? You saw it in the paper? Yeah, we saw oh, you can make all this money. And so we went down and said, okay, we'll train you. And we weren't being paid to be trained. And so we had to get our real estate license, and it was a joke. In Florida? Like no, no, no. We had to get a real estate. We were selling from New York. So you could sell in Florida from New York with a New York license at the yes, time? Yes, correct. Okay. We were selling it from New York office, and it was a joke because the test was so easy. The guy training us, I don't think he went to high school. And he was saying, okay, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, you know, just look in the glossary, and you'll pass the test. Look in the Oh, right. He didn't call it a glossary. He called it a glossum. A glossum? <laughs> the glossum. He has, he had, well, he had a big accent. He was say, eh, just looking at the glossum. Was he Italian too? Yeah. Looking at the glossum and you get the answer. <laughs> and so I took a real, I took looking a real, at the glossum. I got my license taking a test that I didn't know anything about. Look, just looking at <laughs> learning some glossary terms. <laughs> so right now, you know, this is a class operation, right? So I go in and there were about 30, 40 of us, and the guy training us was telling us how to sell really hard. I mean, you're talking about what you wanted to do yeah. really hard, incredibly detailed and brilliant about understanding human nature and how it works, everything. How like So this is the Glossom guy, the same guy? No. And okay. the guy, yeah, that Glossom guy. Yeah, you tell her the sale, or you make it the sale. He, he couldn't sell water to a like a, thir like a guy dying of thirst. <laughs> <laughs> he, he couldn't like... <laughs> He was the like he was the muscle in the operation, you know. Uh, hey, you, they said no. You said no. And he was the guy who take us around. <laughs> he took us around the city. Hey, come on, let's go up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "What's up here?" He goes, "These are ladies of the night. Why don't you get them?" I said, <laughs> "Come on, man." Oh my god! He took us into a bordello. It's like the oh. guy was a joke, oh but you know he served a purpose. Anyway, it's this a funny story. At the end, he got scammed, and he knocked all the teeth, uh, his uh, his boss's teeth out. <laughs> the Swampland so, guy. No, well, no, one with the muscle guy that taught the Glossom guy. So they, they, they made a mistake hiring this guy and lying to him. You, uh, don't lie to him. you can lie to people like me. I'll just go home. But he, <laughs> just go home. he just like, he let him, he just knocked every, you know, knocked all his teeth out because he lied. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> So it was brilliant, a brilliant scam. Uh, they were they were selling the salesman, and that's when I thought brilliant. So um, they're saying, okay, you know, get out there and really stuff like never sell uh, a man alone. Make sure his wife is there, and I mean, really detailed stuff. Oh, uh, because then he'll be like, I got to talk to my wife, right? Really, I mean, incredibly detailed. Um, so, but why was it a scam? The, okay, we, this this yeah. was the scam. Well, I wouldn't say it was. This was the angle. Okay. This was the angle. I realized that after. And then they said, okay, all you people. So what they were doing by putting these ads in the paper, they had an open door. They train everyone. So they had all these people coming in to train, all these people. And then the catch. And he said, you know what? He said, to help you sell, it'd be great if you own the property yourself. Uh, and that was it. Then I understood. Got they got a revolving door. They get all these people tell them to buy the property so they can sell. That was the Those same. are the only people who actually ang buy it. That was the angle. So the people, the students become the yes, sales. Brilliant. The sales that people. was the angle. But, you know, down the road, it's funny because these places were like Port St. Lucie, places but like that. But these are now valuable. Now they're worth a fortune. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> so it was actually a good investment. So, but you were actually selling the land though. There was actual sales of land happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my, my father was smart enough because my father was like, you, met all, you could, oh, I'm just the opposite of my father. You could never scam my father. Ever. <laughs> if, if everyone were my father, there'd be no crime. Yeah, yeah. Because he, oh my God, he, to get money out of him, you had to just like, you know, like put him in a coma.
<laughs> and then he'd wake up to take it from you. Like, he was funny. I have fond memories of visiting my grandparents in Italy. They moved here and then they built a house in Italy and moved back there. And I think they only came to visit us in the U.S. one time in the 90s, I recall. Yeah, and I remember Nono Gino in 93. the backyard with a machete and he had a really fun time clearing out the brush in our brush backyard. Hawk, man. Yeah. Which he, you now do. He was like those guys in the jungle that you go down there <laughs> in like Central America you know, with, you know, with the hat yeah, and yeah. slamming through the jungle, like baking yeah. a path. That was him. Totally. Well, anyway, he, I mean, I, I didn't really put this all into perspective at the time when I was a kid, but I mean, he's a, a he's a success story. He's a, Tale of the American Dream. He came here. He worked three jobs, whatever. He worked in the Plaza Hotel as a waiter. He worked a couple other restaurants. The Palm, Mama Leone's, Pen- which Pen- was Pen- a Pencil. famous. Mama Leone's was a famous restaurant in the bro- in the theater district. Mm-hmm. Really famous, and he worked there. So that was his uh, that was his golden goose right there. Cool. And I remember, yeah. And then so he worked here thirty years. Moved back to Italy. Built a sick house, a really nice house. In the area where he was from originally, on a hilltop with the mountains in the background, it is a gorgeous house. Uh, and you know, he had a garden. I mean, he had a good setup. You know, and as a kid, I didn't really think much about it. But then, as I've gone back, as I've been older, and I've been like, "Holy shit, this is like a sick, nice house, nice setup." You know? Yeah. So yeah. pretty cool. He'd be funny. I mean, he was a prisoner of war in the in the war, right? Yeah, actually, he was a prisoner of the Germans. Then he became a prisoner of the russians and mom's so dad as well was a prisoner German, of, war. of german yeah but you always joke that every italian soldier was a prisoner of war right they gave up right away <laughs> <laughs> i mean they just came they cut off the trucks and gave up their arms right away. <laughs> my father my father knew like he had mussolini wants to conquer the world he, he was using a rifle from world war one he knows like this this, ain't this going isn't down. gonna go well this is not gonna go well this is not gonna go well this is not gonna go well That's indeed too funny um, but, but yeah, so he always kind of had like a funny, if we see Russians on TV, he go, ah, Giulietto de Russia is fucking, <laughs> this fucking, <laughs> I knew exactly. What. Well, he watched, uh, there was this show, comedy show about a German prison camp and he said, yeah, they laugh, but <laughs> you don't want to be there. You don't want to be in a German prison. How long was he in it? Uh, probably about three years, but you know, it's, um, under the Germans though, don't forget the Italians and Germans were allied until the Italians dropped out of the war. So he was kind of like a, what, what they call um, uh, a more friendly prisoner. So they put him to work at the BMW um, factory in Berlin. Stop. And sometimes, yeah, when they bombed it, uh, it's funny, he, um, he, he remembers like people would, um, they didn't have cover. So sometimes they just bury their head in a bucket of water so they wouldn't get uh, you know, um, killed. Jesus. Uh, but it was, uh, no, he saw, he also said he saw some really gruesome things you know, like children being, being used as target practice. And, oh my God. You know, he, um, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. He was not one of these PC people where like, um, you know, he's sensitive about everything. He said, you know, war is hell. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's some really terrible things out there. So don't, don't sweat the small stuff. Crazy. I just find it crazy that, mm. In our lifetime, when I was a kid, I mean, in our neighborhood in Brooklyn, there were like Holocaust survivors walking around the neighborhood with tattoos. Remember, like in the in the neighborhood, there were those people. And it's crazy that in such a short period of time, I snapped my fingers, and now none of those people are around anymore. There's no World War II veterans, really. They're too old, you know what I mean? No, and no. barely in their Holocaust survivors. And not to get too serious here, but it's a very important time to remember some of these events because as more and more time goes by all this conspiracy theory shit, it's a scary, it's a scary thing. You know what I mean? The idea that there are people who are trying to act like it never happened and whatever. If, if you're feeling very sadistic, the original Holocaust documentary, the Alfred Hitchcock one, the Alfred Hitchcock made. Really? Did you know that? No, I never saw it. Yeah. The British government commissioned Alfred Hitchcock to make a documentary about the Holocaust to show people because people sort of heard about it, but nobody really knew until they came out with this. It's on PBS. It's an episode of Frontline that is still streaming that you can watch. Um, and it was incredible because they have footage from both uh, the camps that the Russians uh, discovered and from the camps that, you know, whoever, the British, whoever discovered, or the Americans. And the Russians made the Holocaust people get back in their outfits to try to make more for more compelling film. Wow. They staged it. They said, all right, you guys put it all back on so that this will be this will look extra sad so we can show what the Germans did, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was a good guy. One time you uh, poured a, um, <laughs> a glass of water. He was sleeping. You poured a glass of water on him. Oh, no, no, Gina? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Julieta, why you do that? What'd I say? 
he, I don't know, you were just feeling sadistic at the time. I was being bad? He was trying to explain to you why my uh, Zio Davide, my uncle Dave Davide, he had eight children, and you were trying to you know, find out. And he said, Giulietto, Zio Davide, he married a very warm woman. A very warm. <laughs> it's like, oh my he God. Said he's, he didn't know how to say it. He said, a, a very warm woman. He's, he's a very warm girl. He's I'm a very like, warm what? girl. I was like, what? So, I'm like 10 years old. Uh, I'm like, all right, thanks, thanks. Uh, okay, but we got off topic. Back to- Oh my to, God, well- what, Go ahead, go ahead. The Italy one, that was a great one. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we'll do we, that and we'll get back. Okay, me and my father, we, uh, we stopped off at a, a gas station in the countryside. How old am I? At this point. 13 okay. or 12, something like that. And um, so we got to talking and we went in. You're looking at magazines. He and I bought something and then we went back in the car and we drove off without you. <laughs> 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 About 10 minutes into the, you know, y you are hard to miss because you constantly talked. And we, but. <laughs> What the fuck? No, you talk oh, right, right, right. continuously, right? So, and so after 10 <laughs> minutes, after 10 minutes, we realized there's silence here. He said, oh my God, <laughs> we left him back in the gas station. <laughs> so we came back and there you were looking at magazines, you know, very <laughs> tranquil. And so you got in the car and my father said, Julia, don't tell nobody about this because this is a real dummy thing. <laughs> he goes, this, is, this is real something dummies do. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> That's great. I remember that. Yeah, I remember like I was just in there looking at shit and I didn't really connect. I didn't even land with me that you guys had left, I don't think. I just assumed that you were coming we back. Were gone I, for a long I time. looked outside and you the car wasn't there. I was like, oh, they must have like told me they were going to buy wood or something. I don't fucking know. Whatever, whatever you guys are doing. Uh, that's pretty funny. All right. So anyway, so I had this big job, right? Whatever. Let's call it a big job. It could be a big job. You know, you get what you eat, what you kill type of thing. I... So walk us through the rest of me becoming a comedian. What did you? What were your thoughts? So I okay, said, so once, so I, you didn't talk to me. You're talking to mom, and I'm listening to this conversation. And she's going, no, you know, okay, it's okay, honey. You don't like it? Okay. I said, what? I said, what, what, what? What's he saying? He's saying he doesn't really like his job. Oh, uh, okay. Well, did he say anything else? He goes, yeah, no, he did like this open mic, and he likes stand-up comedy. No! <laughs> I'm doing a G here. Just like danger, danger. I was like, oh my God, tell me this is a dream. <laughs> and obviously, I didn't say a word, right? Do you remember me even mentioning anything? No, no, stay. You like, oh, great. I never said stay. No, you got to like it ever. I said nothing. You said nothing. Zero. But then, so then I started teaching tennis. Actually, at the, story. at the club that he used to work at. So I worked at the same club that he worked at for the same guy. The same guy owned the club in New York City. And he always used to tell me how great of a salesman you were. Back to your sales. That's what he, he goes, said. Your father, he would, he, he'd see a guy who looked like he's homeless and he'd sell him two memberships. <laughs> and then he would allude to the fact that I could not, I did not possess anywhere near those skills. I was not an invested employee. I try, you know, I, I was professional. I showed up, but I was not, I could not live to, up to your. Actually, I would have, in re a commercial real estate, I would have I would have been you a killer. Done, yeah, he always used to tell him that he would have done great in business. I would have been a killer. But, and it's funny, he uh, he was going to get me involved in commercial real estate uh, after my tennis, but I was so valuable to him. He said, no, I'm going to keep him here. Yeah. But it's really, but after the real estate job, it's interesting. Then I started teaching for him. Started te Actually, I started teaching golf. I was a golfer. I started teaching golf for him. He had a golf studio and I was giving golf lessons. Because how did you, at what point did you learn these two sports, by the way? Well, I mean, you know, growing up in the Bronx, it's well, a country club, you know, I know, there are country clubs all over. So, but seriously, And we were, you know, members of five country clubs because my father was a waiter and my mother was a housewife. Yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, like I've actually never known the answer to this. Yeah. Well, how we did you pick okay. up golf and tennis? I lived in the Northern Bronx and there were a couple of golf courses within driving uh, distance and tennis courts were all around. In the city. That's the one thing city has, basketball courts and tennis courts. And you were the only person in your family who drove, right? Didn't you have to teach your parents how to drive? Yeah. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> my father, it's like, it was brutal, brutal, because he always had this dominant thing, and now he right. was my pigeon. Yeah, yeah. And I can, like, tell him how, how bad he is, and, hey, you idiot. And we'd always have a massive fight after each lesson. Really? Yeah, because he wanted to stay dominant, and I'm trying to rise up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but so yeah, so I got into I started teaching golf, and then but you just messed around long enough playing golf that you became good enough to teach. I became it? pretty decent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're um, a good golfer now. Well, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm you always like to think I am. But um, anyways, but I played intercollegiate tennis at hunter but again that was my real sport where did you was, learn tennis to there were begin, courts to be, all over the city i know there but you, are, how did you become good enough to make it onto a tennis team of a college of hunter college well well one of two ways either i was super great or they sucked right <laughs> but <laughs> somewhere like, in the middle <laughs> okay fine but you have like you know you have good strokes like where'd you learn them you're a good you self-taught have, you just learned by yeah. watching guys on tv well, self-taught, you know, and so I didn't have coaches um, then. Right, I, but how did you learn the technique? Did you read a book? You don't have no idea. You don't even know. Self-taught. Yeah, but self-taught, like you figured it out. Like the continental yes. grip is counterintuitive. So well, you were just like, then, oh, this makes sense. No, back then, it was a totally different thing, right? I mean, you, you, you the severe, severe Westerns, no one, no one played with that. They played, their hand was much more over the grip, right? And right, so but how did you learn Eastern, Eastern or continental. How did you learn about that? I just, whatever felt natural to me. And then- So you just f- happened to find the perfect grip and then you that just- That works for me. Well, grips are kind of like very, right? Everyone's got like, now everyone's way back behind the grip, right? Western, heavy Western, heavy Western. So, um, um, but then- So you I, figured it standard out. Standard grip, standard technique, which was wrong back then. They t- touched it a step toward the target- step toward the net when you hit and now it's more open your hip step away open up open your body more so it's totally different now completely different technique so i played with the older technique uh more serve and volley um and now they're just back behind the baseline slamming yeah it's yeah. not it's a different game but no i mean i figured it out just like um golf you know uh reading watching tv learning myself just being self-taught yeah you know? cool and Impressive. I played a lot, you know, played a lot. And then, okay, so then you played whatever. Intercollegiate. So, yeah, so I started, he uh, he knew I played golf, and he said, why don't you come up and give some lessons? And then I was doing pretty well with the golf lessons, and he said, you're a tennis player, why don't you? And so I started working out, and, uh, and the rest is history. I worked there, and it was it was a lot of fun. It was really awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really like it that much, but I always, I, I always uh, admired your approach to it. Because to me, it felt like, I am this like servant. I felt like an inferior person to the person I was giving tennis lessons too to, bad. which bothered me. <laughs> it's too well, bad. But I knew I was, so it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I didn't like that. Like they were nice, but still I'm this like inferior person. And that bothered me a little bit for maybe it's just like a New York city thing. You're the help. You feel like the glorified help. Which bothered me a little bit. It's like, oh, you get to sit at the table and eat. If Wait, it- you went to college. You went to BU, so it's not a low end school. So you're, you know, you're around, you know, uh, people of means. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't go to, you know, BU. Uh, I went to a city college, so I was around more like, you know, earthy people. So you, so, oh yeah. You know what I mean? So to you, it was cool to like meet these. It was a job and job's job. I didn't feel that. You You know, liked it. See, you were in a job feeling that, you know, I should be where they are, Mm. you know, and I didn't think that. That's good. I think that the world would be better. The country at least would be better if more people didn't feel that way, (laughs) the way that I felt, (laughs) felt the way that you felt maybe. Um, Okay. We got a couple of good topics here that I want to make sure we cover. So tell me about, so there's a couple classic gags that you have going one of them is the mclovin id do you yeah, still I, have it yeah i, I do indeed <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you all watched the movie it's super bad of, super cool um and i'm in this gas station and uh they're selling fake licenses you know one of them is um stuff like uh yeah mclovin and <laughs> hillary clinton and so i said i'm buying me a mclovin Let's see it. So there it is. Can you zoom in on it? <laughs> yeah, we will. We will. Do you, uh, so will you you will show this to people sometimes, right? Well, yeah. I sometimes like uh, one. You know, yeah. I'll randomly show it. Sometimes I went to a bank once, and I gave it to the lady, and she's looking at it, and uh, <laughs> she was not American. She was from another country. So she, I don't think she saw the movie. She's trying to figure out what it is. And there's this 28 year old guy, about 20 behind, that looks at looks at it. 28 year old guy looks and starts laughing. 
<laughs> oh, he got it. He got the gag. He got it, and she, and I give him my real license. But I did use it in a supermarket once, successfully, because <laughs> really? I was did- buying beer. Yeah, you know, you have to. <laughs> In Connecticut, you have to show a license when you buy beer, no matter how old you are, right? So I gave it to the lady, and I'm watching her. She's she's writing down the number on the license plate, you know? <laughs> and she's saying, so look, that looks like me, right? <laughs> no, seriously, it's like, yeah, just like me. Like, no, but okay. A little, a little bit, right? Enough that I believe no. the story, but no. No, he's got glasses. Right? So she, she goes, so you lived in Hawaii? <laughs> Because that's for Honolulu, right? It literally says Hawaii in capital letters as well. Yeah, Honolulu, Hawaii. I said, yeah, a couple of years. <laughs> so I got my beer with a a, a phony license. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That was, that was great. Unbelievable. Guys, this is the end of part one of the Big G episode. Uh, we got a lot more coming for you on the next episode. Uh, so look forward to that. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. We had a great time hanging with him. And I learned stuff about him I didn't even know. Uh, which is which is fun. It's kind of how this stuff goes. So very, very cool. Make sure you subscribe at Oops the Podcast on all of the social channels. Make sure you uh, are on our YouTube, download those episodes. Keep sending us emails, oops the podcast at gmail.com. And uh, come see me on the road. August 10th, New York City. I will be at the stand at Comedy Club and Restaurant. Guys, fresh merch drop is upon us. Oops the podcast.com. Shop through your favorite styles. Right now we have hats, t-shirts, all inspired mostly by stuff that happens on the show. Got the Oops Deli Tea, which you'll notice some little sprinkles in there, a couple of references that you might re- recognize, as well as the Plant Boy Tea in black and white, both fire, uh, and the Big G Tea, as well as the Oops OG logo. Uh, get in there. We're going to have more stuff coming down the pipeline soon, uh, but you don't want to miss out on this while they're still, while they're still around. Oopsthepodcast.com. Grab some fresh merch.